After serving in ministry for over 30 years, I have learned one important lesson which I always try to teach to younger clergy because it would have helped me if I had learned this lesson earlier in my life. It is simply that I am not as good as some people say I am, and I am not as bad as some people say I am, that the truth is somewhere between those extremes. When I was first starting out in ministry, people would tell me what a great pastor I was. This followed years of my mother telling me that I was someone special. All this positive reinforcement gave me a little too much confidence. And I'm amazed at how I could rationalize that all the problems in my life were the fault of someone else. After all, if I was that good, it could never be my fault. I eventually got myself into some situations that couldn't be rationalized away. And there was clearly no one to blame but myself. All that positive reinforcement had a sort of boomerang effect in that I would work myself to death in order to absolve my failures and prove that I really was the best pastor in all of Christian history. It took some years for me to recognize that those folks who were so extreme in their assessments of me, that is, the greatest pastor or the worst pastor, likely had other designs that had more to do with them than with me. Whereas I allowed the greatest pastor people to quickly seduce me by their approval into working for whatever happened to be their agendas, I allowed the worst pastor people to confirm my insecurities, that I was really a fraud and not competent to be a legitimate human being. You see, despite my mother telling me that I was special, and all those church members telling me that I was a great pastor, I was afraid that it might not be true, and that I would disappoint my mother and all those church members who I had somehow tricked. I had a sense that I was perfectly imperfect. And I thought that was a liability rather than a valuable insight for living my life. I don't think you need to be a pastor trying to act like the greatest pastor in Christian history to experience the dynamics that I've just described to you. In fact, I think you can take most any vocation, that is, whatever you happen to be doing in life, and find similar patterns of behavior. In Northern Virginia, we have an overflow of highly anxious, high achievers. And even if you go to the backwoods from which I came, the same patterns are there, just dressed up differently. And they all play on our fears and insecurities. So Pia, Lauren, and I thought it might be good to have a sermon series we're calling Mixed Bag to reflect on the ways we manage the complexities of ourselves and the lives we are living. I'm hoping that I can convince you this morning that we're all perfectly imperfect and that it can provide valuable insights for living our lives. The thing that most concerns me about most of you is that you're way too hard on yourselves 
and you have what I would call unrealistic expectations about what you should be doing. I would suggest that this concern has become more prevalent in recent years, and I would point to studies of incoming college students who are much more anxious and depressed than previous generations. I don't think they got this outlook all on their own. And I think it's the product of a culture that seduces all of us with notions of perfection that is fantasy and delusional. Most advertising is built on such seduction that plays on our fears and insecurities. Even church advertising can do this at times, and thus people have unrealistic expectations about what the church is or can do for them. I long for a church that is honest, honest about the human condition, honest about the contradictions that we are as individuals, a strange mix of both saint and sinner, and most importantly, remains hopeful, not so much in ourselves, but in God and in God's love for us. The book of Ecclesiastes can be read as a sort of cynical take on life with its recurring refrain of vanity of vanities, all is vanity, or in your pew Bibles this morning, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. A lot of scholars, as well as other types of people, wonder how the book even made its way into the Bible because it only mentions God in the last verse of the book. I'm not as perplexed by that question because I think we're always talking about God even if we don't appear to be talking about God because God, after all, is present in all that we know and experience. It is typically just a matter of trying to figure out what God is inviting us to recognize. So on those days when, like the writer of Ecclesiastes, we want to say all is vanity or everything is meaningless, even there, God is with us. In our verses of our scripture reading this morning, it's suggested that whoever fears God will avoid extremes. That wisdom makes one wise person more powerful than ten rulers in a city. And that it's instructive to recognize that no one on earth is righteous. No one does what is right and never sins. In other words, it's wise to recognize that I'm not as good as some people say I am, and I'm not as bad as other people say I am. When I was in Blacksburg, Frank Beamer, the football coach, taught me a good lesson that arises from such a recognition that I'm not as good as some people say I am, and I'm not as bad as some people say I am. He said to never get too high or get too low. While he was talking about a football game, it also applies to life. The football coach and the writer of the biblical text seem to understand that a more balanced view to life will help us to navigate the highs and the lows that come to all of us. As we contemplate the wisdom of our scripture reading, I want to share some insights from Rachel Naomi Remen, who's a medical doctor, who also appreciates that life is more than the body and includes the soul in her practice. In her book, Kitchen Table Wisdom, she has an essay entitled, Beyond Perfection. She writes, wholeness 
lies beyond perfection. Perfection is only an idea. For most experts and many of the rest of us, it has become a life goal. The pursuit of perfection may actually be dangerous to your health. The type A personality for whom perfectionism is a way of life is associated with heart disease. Perfectionism can break your heart and all the hearts around you. A perfectionist sees life as if it were one of those little pictures that used to appear in newspapers with the caption, what's wrong with this picture? If you looked at the picture carefully, you would see that the table only had three legs or the house had no door. I remember the aha that these pictures evoked in me as a child. I wonder now why anyone would want to take such satisfaction in seeing what is missing, what is wrong, what's broken. The pursuit of perfection has become a major addiction of our time. Fortunately, perfectionism is learned. No one's born a perfectionist, which is why it's possible to recover. I'm a recovering perfectionist. Before I began recovering, I experienced that I and everyone else was always falling short, that who we were and what we did was never quite good enough. I sat in judgment on life itself. Perfectionism is the belief that life is broken. Sometimes perfectionists have a parent who is a perfectionist, someone who awarded approval on the basis of performance and achievement. Children can learn early that they are loved for what they do and not simply who they are. To a perfectionist parent, what you do never seems as good as what you might do if you tried just a little bit harder. The life of such children can become a constant striving to earn love. Of course, love is never earned. It's a grace that we give to one another. Anything we need to earn is only approval. Few perfectionists can tell the difference between love and approval. Perfectionism is so widespread in this culture that we've actually had to invent Bent another word for love. Unconditional love, we say. Yet all love is unconditional. Anything else is just approval. The pursuit of perfection is built into every professional training. But long before I went to medical school, I was trained as a perfectionist by my father. As a child, when I brought home a 98 on an exam, he invariably responded, what happened to the other two points? I adored my dad, and my whole childhood was focused on the pursuit of those other two points. By the time I was in my late 20s, I had become as much of a perfectionist as he. It was no longer necessary for him to ask me about those two points. I had taken that over for myself. It was many years before I found out that those points don't matter. That they are not the secret to living a life worth remembering. That they don't make you lovable or whole. Life offers us many teachers and many teachings. One of mine was David, who was an artist and my first love. 
the living proof that offices for tracks. While we were together, my driver's license came up for renewal, and I needed to take a written test of the traffic laws. The DMV had sent a little booklet. I studied it for days. All the while, I was memorizing the meaning of the white curb and the yellow curb. David would try to persuade me to join him for a walk or to go to a party or out to dinner or dancing or even just talk. I told him that I couldn't take the time. Of course, I got a hundred on my driving test. Triumphantly, I rushed into his studio shouting that I had gotten a hundred on my driving test. David looked up from his painting with an expression of great tenderness. My love, he said, why would you want to do that? It was not the response I had expected. Suddenly, I understood that I had sacrificed a great deal to get a hundred on a test that I had only needed to pass in order to drive. I had spent days studying for it that I could have spent in wiser ways. I had learned many things that I didn't even want to know. It had felt as if I had no choice. If my father could not approve of me with anything less than 100, I could not approve of myself with less than 100 either. Even on a driving test, like most addicts, I was out of control. It was clearly not about driving. It was not even about grades. It was about needing to deserve love. Fortunately, David did not play by those rules. He didn't even know the game. And I would simply add, God does not play by those rules. God doesn't even know the game. In Methodist theology, we talk about going on to perfection. But as I've tried to pound into you on other occasions, Perfection, theologically, is better understood as wholeness, becoming who God has created us to be. It's not about getting a hundred on the test. Since none of us are perfect, I'm hoping you've gotten that point by now, then the challenge is to be perfectly imperfect by trusting God who made us and who we are taught is always working for our good, which doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to be good. Rachel Naomi Remen tells another story with which I'll conclude. She relates, my mother was a woman full of stories. As a public health visiting nurse, she had sat at many kitchen tables, drinking tea and listening. At the age of 84, she chose to have cardiac bypass surgery because it was the last chance she had for life. Even so, the odds were long. Four chances in ten that she would not survive the operation. But my mother was not your ordinary elderly lady. She had lived her life as a maverick and a risk taker. And to her, those odds looked good. The morning of her surgery, I came to her hospital room two hours early, only to find that her surgery had been moved forward. And I was barely in time to kiss her before they took her upstairs. Despite the sudden change in plans and the daunting odds she was facing, my mother was peaceful, even radiant. 
Oh, good, she greeted me. You're here. There was something I wanted to tell you. I want to be certain you knew that no matter what happens here, I am satisfied. And I hope you will do whatever you can to be satisfied as well. Then she smiled, her charming, rakish smile, and they took her away. Those were her final lucid words to me. For a long time, I thought about these words, trying to understand what they had meant. My mother had achieved a great deal in her life, but I did not think it was this that had given her such ease and contentment in the face of possible death. Slowly, I have come to understand that the key to this sort of satisfaction lies in the inner world. As perfectly imperfect people, let us place our trust not in ourselves or one another, but in God and strive for satisfaction. 